Good morning, good evening. My name is Joe Fish Kay. I am Principal Scientist, and uh, it is my pleasure today to uh, introduce you to Yvette Wan from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, I am delighted to see Yvette come here. We've, been, uh, we've sponsored her research before as part of the Mozilla Research Grants, um, which, as you all know, is one of my deep loves. Um, but I think it's particularly interesting. She's going to be talking about not the work that we sponsored her to do. She's going to be talking about a different project. Um, but I think it gets at a really a core question that we have uh, within the company. If you look at the problems of the internet right now, so many of them are predicated on issues around privacy, right? Issues around people knowing other people's data. Um, uh, you look at the whole issues with Facebook. You look at the data leaks. These are all privacy issues. Well, okay, why, why, are, why do we have these privacy issues? Well, it's not just because people are nosy. It's not because someone like wants to know what you had for breakfast because they like to know what people had for breakfast. They want to know what you had for breakfast so they can sell you more stuff, right? The underlying problem is this advertising-driven uh, approach to how the web is funded right now. And that's why I think this work is quite so exciting, right? If we can find, if we can look at one particular ecosystem within the web that is supported through digital patronage, that gives a very different model for what a future of the web might look like. So that's why I'm really excited to see this happen. Um, that's why I'm really excited to hear about this work. And that's why I'm so de delighted to introduce you all to Yvette One. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me, and thank you for those who are um, joining outside of the Mozilla HQ. Um, like Joe Fish said, my name is Yvette, and I'm a professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology and also director of the Social Interaction Lab. And our research has been um, funded in part by Mozilla as well as the National Science Foundation. And today I'll be talking about digital patronage. Um, this is New Jersey Institute of Technology. We're located in Newark, New Jersey, which is very famous for its airport and also very close to New York. These are some of the students in my lab. I really love working with these students. Um, several of students have also worked on the research I'm going to present today. So my research in a nutshell is in the field of human computer interaction. And I try to understand how people use different social systems. And those social systems can range from social media, Facebook, Twitter, to online games, uh, live streaming, which is what I'm going to be mainly talking about today. And so I also uh, look at the effect of using these social systems. And so it's kind of a communication plus psychology plus computing field. One of my favorite lenses in which I look at research is social provision. And this is a term that describes the exchange between people that happens with a system in between. And social provision can be anything. You can exchange emotions, you can exchange information, but you could also exchange money. And all of those are linked together. So what is, what is patronage? Well, according to the dictionary, patronage is the action of a patron supporting, encouraging a person, institution, work, or art. And if you look historically, traditionally, wealthy people or institutions have been patrons. So for example, in the Renaissance period, you see the influence of the Medici family uh, who have sponsored the development of music, the um, invention of the piano, they supported Galileo, so science, uh, philosophy, art, and architecture. So a lot of the uh, beautiful artwork that we know from that period, these are all funded by individual uh, patrons. So here we have the Mona Lisa. On the left, we have Beethoven. And on the right, we have Christopher Columbus, whose expeditions were primarily funded uh, by Spain. But it's not necessarily an old thing. Even today, when we look at art, for example, we see major individuals uh, who are patrons. For example, um, this is a Broad, one of the many Broad, Broad uh, museums uh, funded by Eli Broad. And then we also have the Getty Museum, which houses a huge collection, uh, art collection by Getty. So, in some sense, patronage is old, it's new, uh, it's been around for a very long time. So what is digital patronage? Well, 
Digital patronage, as I define it, is people directly supporting content creators who are their own media entities. And this is happening through these new online financial systems. So we have uh, systems such as Twitch or Patreon that allow people to post content and allow patrons to give money to them through the system. And then there are also some direct financial systems such as Venmo or PayPal where people can directly uh, transfer money to somebody else. So what are the main characteristics of digital patronage? Well, I think the most important thing is that it's recurring support. It's not that you're giving money one time to someone, it's that you're doing so on a monthly or a weekly uh, or a yearly basis. And the second thing is that this enables the formation of communities around the creator. And so instead of being project-based, which is the essence of a lot of kind of crowdfunding that we've saw, seen, such as Kickstarter or Indiegogo, where people come together to pitch money to a project. This is more about pitching money in to support a person. Um, this is a content creator. His name is Ninja. He's a professional video game player, and he broadcasts his video game play online. Um, he used to be one of the largest uh, streamers, live streamers on Twitch, um, although he recently moved to another live streaming service called Mixer. Ninja, just based on subscriptions of people who were paying money for content that he was providing for free, just based on that he was making at least a million dollars a month. And these are somewhat old statistics from last year. And the interesting thing here is that his content is completely for free. So nobody has to pay, but people choose to pay. And the interesting thing is that it's not necessarily platform dependent. So Ninja recently moved to Mixer, like I mentioned before, and his patrons followed him there. So that was a very interesting phenomenon. Um, and he is a very uh, good example of a hugely successful case. Now, of course, not all people who create content and broadcast online are as successful as Ninja. Um, but there are also examples of small content creators who are also uh, making some money through digital patronage. This is Howard Rheingold. He's a, uh, a writer, a, an artist, and uh, he's retired. But he has this page on Patreon where people subscribe to him for as little as $1 a month. And he says it's not enough to completely live off of those earnings, but he, it's able to buy some of his art supplies and sustain some of his hobbies. The really interesting thing about live streaming, which is going to be the medium that I'm focusing on today, is that it affords a lot of interaction between the content creator and the viewers. So here's a, a screenshot from uh, Twitch, and this woman is broadcasting, and on the right side you see that people are uh, posting live comments as the broadcast is happening. And because of this interaction, it creates a lot of intimate um, interactions between the content creator and the supporters. Um, we see a lot of really unique content happening on live streaming. These are just a couple of, of examples from Twitch where you see people in cosplay cooking or making music or drawing. And these people, probably not all of them are able to make a living off of the patronage, but it is providing a supplemental sort of income. And this is very different from more traditional models where you have to be a very successful person with a lot of viewers to make money. So of course there are examples of this. This is um, a streamer who um, plays online games and she has received some sponsorship from Logitech and Acer um, tech companies and that is displayed on her screen. So she's being paid to put those ads up on her stream. But these kind of sponsorships or advertisements can only really work when you have a huge viewership, which is for the majority of content creators not the case. So there are various ways to support a content creator. The first one is through direct donations by just giving them money. And this could also be considered as a type of tipping 
behavior. Um, the second is monthly subscriptions, and I think this is what is the key to making digital patronage. Um, this is where you provide money on a monthly basis to a content creator. And the third is physical gifts. We see a lot of people who like content creators actually sending them things through the mail. And then finally, we have an indirect support through charity streams. So a lot of live streamers sometimes host streams where any money that they make during that time frame, they donate to a specific cause. And so when the patrons um, donate to the streamer, that money isn't going directly to the streamer, but it is still providing them with a lot of support. This type of so-called tipping behavior is very interesting in this context, especially in live streams, because it involves a lot of virtual gifts. And in the US, uh, this has gotten a lot of traction, but uh, when it comes to virtual gifts, really the market uh, in China is really huge. Um, you see uh, on the right side, this is a female streamer, and people are buying these little emojis or emoticons with real money to give to her. So when she receives it, she's not actually receiving any kind of tangible product, but this kind of picture on a screen. But people are paying lots of money, like you know, up to tens of thousands of dollars sometimes, to give these virtual gifts to streamers. Um, Twitch. Uh, introduced this system called cheering um, with their own kind of monetary system back in June 2016, where you can purchase bits with real money and then give these little emoticons to the streamers. So that creates like very interesting interactions between people. Um, here's a screenshot from a streamer, one of my favorite streamers, Angry Pug. You can see at the bottom that he has like this tip jar. And every time somebody gives him bits, um, that fills up with like the virtual, uh, virtual currency. And on the top, you'll see that somebody has donated $5. And so those are direct donations. So for streamers, there's a lot of different ways in which they can um, make money from their viewers. In terms of subscriptions, um, there are different tiers, and different systems have different ways of doing this. So for example, um, on Twitch, uh, which is owned by Amazon, you only have four options. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you can subscribe to someone for free, or you can pay roughly five, 10, or $25 a month. And these can come with different perks, and the content creator is the person who, who adjusts what those perks will be. On sites like Patreon, they have adjustable tiers. So the content creator uh, decides uh, what kind of perks will come with the different tiers. And those perks can be anything from access to different content, access to the person's social media. So for example, a lot of people have private Snapchat accounts, which you cannot access until unless you are a certain subscriber. Uh, special emojis or uh, subscription badges. So I know this seems very abstract, so let me give you a few examples. Um, this group of content creators, they're called the Try Guys. They became kind of famous through BuzzFeed. Now they have a page on Patreon where you can choose from multiple options of way to, uh, to support them. Um, there are many tiers, I've just put three on here as an example. For example, for only $3 a month, you get 24 hour early access to their videos. But if you wanted to increase that to $5, you get access to their uh, chat server. And for 500 or more per month, they give you a personal shout out in their podcast. Um, so this is a, a unique way of, of content creators deciding what is the more added value. On Twitch, um, some of these perks are appear on, on the screen for other viewers to see. So for example, um, this is again the streamer Angry Pug, and on the right side are people who are 
writing things in chat, and you see that some people have this icon next to their name that looks like a pug, but they're all different colors. And the colors are based on how long that person has been a subscriber. So if you look at the chat, you know how long somebody has been there. And that kind of mechanism of visually identifying someone's patronage also contributes to the dynamics of the community, uh, how people interact with each other, as well as how the streamer choose to interact with the viewers. On this slide, these are some of the unique emoticons that you can get by actually subscribing to Angry Pug. So if you pay $5 a, a month, um, you can get these special emoticons. And one might think, why would you pay money to buy emoticons, but if you're a viewer in this community and if you want to participate in the chat, like I showed you earlier, using these emoticons has a special language for that community that other people outside of the community may not really understand. Um, so some of these are pretty straightforward. You know, they're like a cute dog or, or a screenshot of his face, but some of the things, for example, in the middle, like JFM, uh, someone outside this committee would have no idea what that means, but by posting this emoticon, there's like this insider language that is happening that helps bond the community together. So now I'm going to talk about uh, a specific study um, that will uh, be appear in the ACM Chi Play proceedings next month. And this is a study about why people subscribe to live streamers on Twitch. And this was based off of more than 300 hours of structured observation, as well as a paper survey that we did at TwitchCon, which is a convention for Twitch enthusiasts. Um, my students and I went there and we actually distributed paper surveys to people who were waiting in line for things. And then we also had interviews with Twitch subscribers. So we have some statistical results as well as some qualitative results. I won't show the exact numbers, um, but I'll uh, conceptually describe the findings. So um, one of our first questions was, why do you subscribe? And how is a subscription different from a one-time donation? And unsurprisingly, we found that the reason people give money on a one-time basis and the reason why people subscribe on a regular basis are very, there's a lot of similarities. So for example, they want to become closer with the streamer or they really enjoy the content and they feel like they want to pay for the entertainment that they're receiving or there's some educational value. So for example, um, a lot of uh, uh, viewers, for example, look at these streams to learn something and they feel like, they want to pay for, for learning. But there were two distinct motivations that were unique to subscriptions that we didn't see in donations. And the first one was they want attention from the streamer. And the second one was they want some benefits. And those benefits include, for example, getting special emojis or having a special subscription badge next to their name that I showed you earlier. We thought this was really interesting, um, and this was based on quantitative statistical results. So we went into some more in-depth interviews to really understand why, what does it mean to want attention, and what does it mean to want benefits? And we were very surprised um, that people use the term return on investment. They were saying, I want, uh, when I'm subscribing, it's all about the ROI. And what the ROI means for different people is somewhat variable. But uh, when we thought, when I, well, at least personally, when I thought about patronage, I always thought about, oh, I'm just supporting this person because I really like them. But some people really had this idea of they want something in return for giving uh, my money. The second thing was loyalty. And a lot of patrons were very proud of how much time they had dedicated to uh, to to the to the person that they um, to the content creator, and so even if it's the same amount of money, for example, you know if you're uh, donating ten dollars uh, or subscribing for ten dollars a month over a year, that's one hundred twenty dollars. But they thought that the twelve month subscription was more valuable than a one time one hundred twenty dollar donation because it means that they were invested 
for that time. And th this also tied into why people really wanted to have those badges next to their ID, because that was also an indication of their loyalty. And the third one was recognition from streamer. And um, of course, not all patrons wanted recognition from streamer, but there were, were, was a subset where they thought that if they were a patron for long enough, then the streamer might notice them. Um, and this has some interesting implications, especially for what it means for a streamer when they start scaling up and having more patrons. The second thing we looked at was the initial reasons why people uh, subscribe versus their continuation reasons. And one of the things um, that was really interesting about the continuation reasons was this perceived relationship, which was often parasocial in nature. Uh, parasocial is an academic term that's used to describe when someone feels very a strong connection to someone that they don't really know. So traditionally, this has been used in a lot of research of like attachment to fictional characters or television dramas, things like that. But we see that, again, in this live streaming space. And then we also see patrons uh, wanting to continue because they think that they're having a financial impact on the streamer. And they feel very proud that they're really helping out the streamer financially. And so one of the interesting things here is that as a streamer gets larger, one would think that, oh, once a streamer's big enough, they don't need the money anymore. And that was true for some people, but for others, they, even if the streamer was extremely popular and making a lot of money, they thought that their contribution was what kind of made that person who they were. Um, the next thing I want to show is kind of the relationship between why people subscribe and other supportive behaviors. And this shows a lot about kind of how the different subscription reasons map onto different supportive behaviors. So on the left side, we have financial support, personal connection, and these are the reasons why people subscribe. And on the right side, we have buying merchandise, giving gifts, giving direct money, uh, buying bits, and gifting subscriptions to other viewers. So this was a statistical analysis, and it's hard to show numbers through a PowerPoint, so I uh, made this kind of uh, diagram. Uh, when we look at financial support, we find that people who support uh, or who are patrons because they want to provide financial support, they are also engaged with a lot of other supportive behaviors, such as giving money, buying merchandise, etc. But we saw that people who were more likely to provide uh, patronage because of financial support were less likely to give subscriptions to other, other viewers. Next, we have personal connection. Um, these are people who are patrons because they want to feel this connection with the streamer. And we found that the only thing that that was related to was buying merchandise. And again, we see this negative relationship between a personal connection and gifting subscriptions to other viewers. Third, um, these are people who are being patrons because they really enjoy the content. And we see that these people, similar to the financial support, they also buy a lot of merchandise, they give money, they give bits, and again, they are less likely to give subscriptions to other people. So it seems it's really about their experience and not wanting to help out other others. Um, next, we have educational value, which is related to purchasing merchandise and giving gifts, but none of the other things. And then finally, we this is, I thought this was very interesting. People who are patrons because they want attention, they don't engage in any of the other supportive behaviors. And then people who want benefits um, are more likely to give bits and give gifts. And we think that this is because if you give bits in the system, the Twitch system also tracks how many bits you've given and you can also get a badge based on that. So maybe it's the visibility of their patronage that also contributes to this. So um, finally, what does digital patronage enable? First, niche content. You could uh, maybe be someone who's doing something very, very specific like dressing up in 50s wardrobe and cooking old recipes. 
um, that may not appeal to a large enough people, uh, a large enough audience to make money off of advertisements, but could be enough to have a very small audience. Um, we think this is really interesting and also uh, could put be potentially scalable because we do see very positive examples. And at the very top, for example, um, these are two of the top uh, content creators on Patreon, and you see that one is a podcast producer and the other one is Brandon Stanton who, who creates the Humans of New York series. And um, they're making quite a lot of money per month to be able to sustain their jobs. Now, of course, this is kind of on the top end of things. We also have, on the bottom line, um, the people who are content creators who maybe the income from the patronage, maybe it pays the bills, or maybe it's the bottom line that could, that gives them the freedom to not have to be like hustling all the time. So for example, um, this is Lori Penny, she's a journalist, and um, recently she hit $3,000 per month in terms of the patronage support that she's receiving, and she wrote this post about how this enables her to have a lot of more freedom and that she doesn't have to juggle two or three jobs because at least this is kind of like a baseline, uh, provides a baseline type of salary for her. And I think this is really interesting, has interesting implications for freelancers because freelancers don't have any baseline and this, even if it's not a lot, through digital patronage, perhaps that baseline could be there. And I think this is also um, interesting because it could lead to more content that goes against market forces. When you think about what kind of content gets a lot of traffic online, um, not all of that content is necessarily quality content. And that's why we see things like yellow journalism. Um, that's why uh, news about celebrities gets more clicks than politics or social issues. But this digital patronage could enable the support of content that may not be viable with advertising money. And I think that's really exciting. I think digital patronage allows us to revisit the long tail. Uh, in 2008, Chris Anderson uh, proposed that the internet enables a lot of proliferation of smaller and niche brands and that, um, and that the focus could move away from kind of mainstream blockbusters or megatrends so that the long tail will become equivalent to the head. Now, this was very um, idealistic and has been refuted. Uh, for example, in the Harvard Business Review, um, there was some research suggesting that indeed the tail is long and flat, but that doesn't necessarily mean it really catches up to the head. And so there has been research shown that the tail is pretty long, but it's not necessarily very thick. But with digital patronage, would that change the long tail? Um, will patronage catch up to blockbusters? I don't think so. Um, even if you look at, for example, platforms such as Spotify, a few blockbuster musicians such, such as Drake, they still account for more than 90% of the plays. So, um, so I don't think patronage will totally change, you know, um, the, the industry in terms of how we promote like big names. However, maybe the tale will be more sustainable. And this means, what this means is that there's like this shift from selling content to selling me. So the content creator is becoming the brand. Um, this streamer, her name is Amaranth, she's a very talented uh, cosplayer. She does this thing called ASMR, which is um, gently whispering into a microphone. And actually, there are many, many, many people who do this. So when you think of the content itself, it's not that the content that she produces is necessarily superior to others, but she has a very unique brand and way of interacting with people that make people want to follow and also want to make people give money to her, even when they can access her content for free. The second thing is creating relationships. Um, before, unless you were like a very, you know, uh, famous person, you don't really know who your who who your supporters are. But through these digital patronage systems, now you know who those people are, and that way you can get to know them in a more systemic way. And also, those supporters can form communities around the creator. 
Um, this is a woman who makes quilts that have video game themes. It's a very, very specific art. And um, here you see her kind of streaming in her workshop where she's just has the camera on while she's building these quilts. Um, she has her cats watching, and if you give her some money, she will give treats to her cats. Um, I think this is really interesting because she does not make a money. Uh, her, her main profits are not from the digital patronage. But this is a way for her to connect with people who will potentially buy her quilts. And so she has built this community that may not be generating the money, but leads to other derivative um, products. So finally, some of the final thought nuggets that I have on patronage, at least as, it, uh, as I see it on Twitch, is that it's a mix of the emotional and the tangible. There's money, but it's not just you know, uh, thoughtless money. People are very attached and there's a sense of the money that I'm giving is attached to loyalty, it's attached to relationships. And so this kind of tangle of the financial and emotional, I think, from a research perspective is very interesting. And the second point is that the reasons why people are patrons are so different. Some people, they don't care about what they receive in return. They just want to support that person because they just love what that person's doing. But other people are very keen on what they're getting in return. And I think that from the perspective of the content creators, it's also really important to know that there are these different motivations of the patrons. And then third, virtual representations mean something. I was very surprised at how much value people were adding to these little emoticons or the these pictures that are that are showing the badges next to their names. And um, I think this is especially interesting because, like, as we move into digital currencies and things like that, we always think that there has to be some kind of tangible product attached to money for it to have value. But we see that these pictures basically can have a lot of value. And then finally, um, this also leads to a lot of relational management that the creators have to engage in. And um, the scholar Nancy Baim also talks about relational management in her recent book that is about musicians. Um, but we see that not just with musicians, but content creators in general, when you have this direct connection with your patrons, you feel obligated to have to interact with them. And that creates a lot of interesting and often uh, emotionally draining dynamics. So finally, what's next? Uh, investigating other patronage platforms, such as Patreon. Um, also understanding patronage and brand management practices from the creator's perspective. So today I was mainly talking about the supporters, but what does it look like from the other side? And then finally, developing and exploring new systems that support different patronage activities. So as a, as a patron, currently there aren't a lot of systems that sh give you metrics on your own patronage history or the different people that you are supporting. And it's just also the same on the creator end because we've talked to creators too. And it just seems that everything is digitally uh, Everything exists digitally, but the metrics are not quite there yet. And then, of course, like understanding how growth of patronage occurs. If you're a very, very small creator and you start gaining more and more patrons, what does that patron management look like? And what is the bigger impact that it has on the creative industry? I think this is a really exciting new area, and I'm looking forward to seeing where digital patronage goes from here. Thank you very much. So there's like this really enthusiastic Slack channel discussion of you that you don't know about. Right? Excellent. Or not you, of, of, of the work, right? Um, my first question on here, so first off, thank you very much. Um, and the general consensus is like raucous enthusiasm just poorly communicated <laughs> through, um, through the internet. Um, first question is from Janice Sai, who's up in Seattle. Um, and you alluded to this, I think, in your penultimate slide. Um, in Yvette's research, did anyone talk about the burnout or the mental slash physical demand of creating content 24 seven? 
Yes, and this is something that is discussed among creators all the time. If you go to conventions for creators, they have panels on which they try to educate each other on how to manage burnout. Um, I think that there's uh, there's a lot of advice, especially given to new creators, about don't think that this is you have to be on 24/7. And there's a lot of concern about mental health and a lot of dialogue around that. And so. Um, I think there is a huge awareness in the creator community that you have to, if you're spending a lot of time on air, you have to spend a lot of time off air. Um, so I think there's a uh, there's a lot of acknowledgement and um, kind of discussion around that, which I think is very healthy. Cool. Um, second question I have here is from Diane Tate, who may be in the San Francisco office. Um, I'm not sure. Um, no, now I've got a picture of me. That's fine. Um, and Diane asks, what lessons from supporting individual influencer personality types can we carry over to the digital patronage of products and services? Does that make sense? I think it's asking a question from a very particular Mozilla point of view, so if it doesn't make sense, I can elaborate a little. Um, could you elaborate a little? Sure. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, we're trying to figure out alternate ways to fund the internet. Mm -hmm. And obviously you can think about maybe uh, what if Mozilla was to do some sort of service that people would subscribe to in a similar kind of way? Mm -hmm. So there's some of the stuff that's out there right now, like our work around um, making, it, telling you whether your passport was stolen, password was stolen in a password breach, right? Mm -hmm. um, or uh, um, we are experimenting with other sort of privacy and safety uh, and security kind of services. Um, the, are there particular personality types that, that are, I think Diane is just sort of trying to ask, if we start to think about the personality of Mozilla, are there directions we should lean into, right? Right, right. I think the important thing that I, at least, and this is just my opinion, is that digital patronage will not work for everything. And what I think that it does work with is when you have a strong individual who has a personality that is their own media entity yeah. so that people feel like they have a direct connection. But I think that when you're starting to look at this at an institutional level, it loses some of its merit. And I think this is one of the reasons why newspapers have really failed to uh, to continue the subscription model that they used to have. Because if you think about newspapers a long time ago, you have to pay X number of dollars to get your news. Now, most people don't do that. And they've and so they've switched to an advertising model which has its own, own problems. But you see people are supporting individual journalists and writers. And so I think that patronage is something that requires a very central character mm -hmm. and that if you try to do this at like an organizational level it lose that sense of intimacy so I think that maybe one thing that could possibly do it is even if, you, if you're doing trying to do something from Mozilla's perspective is not say okay this is Mozilla but maybe create a persona that could be the proxy of Mozilla so maybe you have this you know you have a mascot that's a really cute fox maybe that fox is the is the persona it, that pers it's like it becomes the content creator or the entity that people can relate to, and there's actually someone managing yep. that as a brand. Yeah, no, I think that would be interesting. I mean, that being said, I note that the top two Patreonages, Patreonages? that's a horrible word, and they, it's probably the right one, <laughs> Patreon and it's, users. it still makes me uncomfortable. No one should use that word yeah. again. Um, the top two Patreonages are Chapo Trap House and um, Humans of New York. Both of which, I mean, the Humans of New York in particular is, is there, I mean, there is some person who does it, but their personality is not sort of the core part of what goes on there. And, and Chapo Trap House, again, has this, you know, it is beyond the individual. Right, right. right. I mean, I think those are, um, I think it's, first of all, there's people that are successful and on the top end of content creators. And yep. then there are people who are kind of starting out. And I think that at the top level, you will always see people who were, who are hugely successful, not because they are on Patreon, but because they were successful yeah. before and they basically brought their supporters to Patreon. So I think that's a different example. But when we look at people who start out on Patreon, I think it's, it, it's different. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we see kind of this, uh, when we see the distribution, like the majority of people are not there because they were already famous. Yep, that's a good point. Um, 
I have a few more questions on the Slack channel. Do we have any p p questions in person? David. Hello. Thanks. Um, did you, in your survey or in, in any of the observation, notice people stopping their subscription or deciding that they didn't want to donate anymore or didn't want to follow? Because I know that part of the mental health problems for creators is the fear that they'll leave and go to something new. Is that, is that at all part of your analysis? Yes, so there are definitely are people who stop. Um, I think the top three reasons were, um, one, the person switched, completely switched their content, and the reason they, they were a patron was because of the content. And so when the content changed, they were no longer interested in that. Um, the second reason was looking at, um, uh, and I kind of gave this example earlier too, but there were some people who, they were not very affluent themselves, but they really wanted to support someone because they were so poor. But then when that person became financially successful, since the patron was still not in an affluent position, they felt like they didn't have to support them anymore. Um, so that has a kind of dual implications because there were also people who wanted to continue to support even though the person they thought was at a good financial state. Um, and I think the uh, final one uh, was related to people who were patrons because they wanted this personal connection with the streamer. And after a time, they felt like they weren't achieving that. And I think that's really hard from the creator's perspective because everyone is expecting to or wanting to be your friend. And that's really hard to do from a creator's perspective. Mm -hmm. Would you say, follow up quickly, would you say that then these need to seem like grassroots efforts to get support and then at a, at a point in which they seem like successful going concerns, mm -hmm. people might find the next grassroot thing. So that the personality that's important is sort of like a scrappy upstart. That's right. what people really want to invest in on a platform like Twitch or Patreon. I mean, there are definitely people like that who purposely seek out smaller streamers so that, you know, if you go into a stream where there are only a handful of people and you start talking there, you're going to get noticed. So people who want that attention are probably uh, less likely to continue if the person gets bigger. But that's like a, that's not all patrons are like that. There are a subset of patrons who are like that. Um, I have a question here from Ashley Boyd, who is uh, part of the Mozilla Foundation, um, and she's, I believe, in the San Francisco area, I think, usually. She may not be, I don't know. Um, and she says, I'm curious about the degree to which patrons understand and value that this direct support of content creators challenges the pervasive business model of surveillance and ads. Like, is this a thing people know, or is this just our reading of it? Um... Could you read the last part of the question, yeah. please? How much, uh, I'm curious about the degree to which patrons understand and value that their direct support of content creators challenges the pervasive business model of surveillance and ads. Right, right. I don't think they're necessarily thinking about surveillance, but in terms of ads, I, there is definitely this sense of pride that they're partaking in an alternative Hmm. means of supporting creators. And what I mentioned earlier about loyalty, um, the way that people think that their time is more valuable than money, I think is a very good indicator of that. So um, I would say the majority of patrons probably know that you know, without them, the, the content creator may otherwise not have a good means of making money. And so I think they're very aware of that. Um, good. Uh, do we have any questions in person? Portland, how's it going, dudes? Um, Portland's waving. Portland's thumbs up. Good. Um, San Francisco, Vancouver, Toronto. Vancouver, I can vaguely see you there, clustered at one end of the table. Waving. They're nice and waving. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess one thing I would like to add yes. to kind of follow up to the previous point is that there are people who, who do think about kind of the impact that they're making, but then there are also a lot of people, especially younger people, that they're just paying $5 to get the emoticons. 
and there's not much about like oh like the creator like they just want that emoticon and that's what I find like very fascinating about like how much power just having that emoticon has and I think it's really interesting to look more into that cool um, next question uh, from Jared Hirsch and I forget what Jared is um, but he asks are there examples of brands sponsoring creators on a single track daily or weekly schedule like a conference or a TV or a radio channel on the live stream yeah um, there are there are uh, so there are some efforts that are made by content creators individually like those who are at least savvy enough to to get different sponsorships um, twitch also facilitates some of that so for example uh, if you're a game player uh, and you are not big enough to have a sponsor but twitch for example if there's a new game coming out they will say if you play this game for X number of hours uh, to your audience, then you will get some kind of amount of money. So in that case, that's kind of like, uh, kind of like product placement to mm -hmm. a certain extent. And Twitch helps facilitate that to some extent for the content creators who are not big enough to secure those product pl placements on their own. Um, I also know that there's a lot of product placement in, in regards to equipment, streaming equipment. So like gaming chairs, um, you see uh, a lot of energy drinks are sponsoring larger streamers so that they have like the energy drink refrigerator in the background. Um, so small things like product placement, but I think those are uh, for smaller creators, like very difficult to procure. Yeah. I noticed that in your screenshot of Ninja announcing his switching and he's wearing this huge Adidas logo, you know <laughs> some, someone at Adidas was just like, all right, high five, I've just made my bonus for the year, right? Like, that moment. He has, like, when you get to the live level of Ninja, it's no longer a content creator. It's basic, he's basically a celebrity. He has a whole huge team managing different parts of it, so. Yeah. Um, I've got three more questions that have come in. Um, first one for Ansel Hook. I wonder if content creators get together to form syndicates or groups where patronage gives you access to all of the creators in that group. Oh, that's really interesting. I think the system currently doesn't support that, but there are definitely, um, in ad hoc ways, co uh, content creators get together to form groups and they direct their supporters to other people in that group. So for example, uh, and we see this a lot in, not in so much in gaming circles, but in people who do kind of more artsy things because uh, especially for people who do art, they feel like the other person is not a threat because artwork is just not really uh, competable, I guess, like uh, competing. Yep. Um, they, uh, not everybody is streaming 24 seven. So when they're done with their stream, they will direct their viewers and say, hey, here's this other mm. content creator who, who may who is similar to me that you guys might want to check out, and that way, they also share their patrons as well. Cool. Um, Gloria Kim asks, you mentioned that this model of exchange rewards the individual brand or personality. Were there characteristics common among the top performers, and how did that compare to the performers who found niche audiences and perhaps a more modest degree of success? That's a good. I think there's a very big distinction between. Um, there are content creators who are famous because of their content and the content is so excellent. And then there are content creators who are just, who people like them because of their personality. Mm. Um, and there is a bit of a distinction. And I think Ninja is a very unique case where he has a personality and he also is able to, you know, snipe people who are flying out of the air. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons he's successful. But one of the uh, content creators I was showing you earlier, Angry Pug, he plays this game. He's decent at the game. He's not the absolute top player, but the way that he plays is so interesting. He makes all these weird sounds with his mouth. And it's just so entertaining to watch. And so I think that, and, and, and he knows that. He knows that like it's his personality that's really drawing people in. So I think that we see these kind of dual things between people who are like, okay, it's just about the content, and people who are more like their personality. Cool. Um, I have a question here from Tony Murphy. Um, and Tony asks, 
Have you seen any content creators create their own coin or like fintech payment processing system so that payments, payments are outside a platform specific? Um, I think <laughs> he then continues, maybe in the future I could get a credit card and get points from, from my favorite point content creators. That's a really interesting idea. Um, currently, well, at least based on this study on Twitch, um, content creators do, there is a way for people to directly give money, like for example, through PayPal. Uh, hmm. But the interesting thing is that the content creators don't necessarily encourage that over the subscription via Twitch, even if the subs so for example, if somebody subscribes $5 on Twitch, they're not going to get the whole $5 because Twitch, Amazon takes a cut. But if they received a direct payment through PayPal, they could get the full $5. However, they also, they really value getting it through Twitch because Twitch tracks uh, how many subscribers you have. And then the subscribers also get that badge. And so I, I think it's these added visual visualizations of people's patronage that make people prefer to get that through the site. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I think that may be an interesting thing to, to think about sort of moving forward. Kind of right. Thing. But I think the other thing is that right now there's not a lot of alternatives. So if an alternative platform comes up where it doesn't incentivize people being on the platform, then we might see a lot more diverse uh, financial transactions happening. Yeah, although, yes, you'd, you'd need a company who really wanted a sort of diverse web for that to happen. Mm. Mm. Anyway. I wonder what kind I of company that what, would be. I wonder what that um, I will say that somebody commented, I, I can't find the exact comment, someone was sort of really delighted that somehow we'd had this whole discussion and the word blockchain hadn't been mentioned once, which of course I have now broken by saying it, but you know, it was, <laughs> I, I, I still thought that was sort of glorious. I, I, I was thinking of talking about that and I didn't because the research on that is so preliminary, but um, we see patronage, like especially in the art, taking form in, in blockchain. So for example, if you are a small like uh, small investor, you can't buy a, like a Rothko painting because it's billions of dollars. But we see in the we're seeing in the art world that uh, through kind of blockchain, there's uh, people buying shares of art. And I think that's also kind of a new form of patronage where before it used to be you had to be really rich to purchase this one mm. piece of art. But now we're seeing kind of uh, through blockchain technology, so the art world is really kind of toying with that, and all of their latest conferences have, have all been about like blockchain art. So definitely, I think there's a uh, an aspect of patronage there that needs to be explored. Cool. Um, I have a question from Katie Pierce on Twitter who asked, um, how are these funds treated by tax systems? How does this work in a globalized economy? And how does this money actually show up in a creator's bank account? Right, that's, that's a really a good question. That's a really good question. I think that um, uh, in terms, if you are on Twitch or Patreon, then depending on where you're located, you have to uh, file uh, that you receive a tax document, kind of similar to if you were on eBay or something like that as a, as a vendor. I'm not sure how that works locally for all the different countries. I know that Twitch has a global audience and there are people from all around the world streaming, but as to how the tax structure works from the different, uh, in the different companies, I'm, I'm not aware of. But the, do you have a sense of how much of a cut the platform takes? Like if I give you a $10 thing, how much do you walk away that with? That is very ambiguous, uh, and there's no clear rules about it. Um, what I understand uh, is that depending on, it's kind of a rich get richer model, mm. where if you're a newer streamer and uh, they take a larger cut, but as you accumulate more, they actually take a lesser cut. Um, but the, I don't think that there are hard and fast guidelines on like what that threshold is. Um, there are also some uh, loose or uh, guidelines, at least from the streamer's perspective, about what it takes to become 
a streamer that can start earning money because not everyone who streams can earn money. You have to have, there are some conditions that need to be met and you have to meet those conditions and agree to certain things before you can start actually making money on Twitch. And there is a element of subjectivity that goes into those decisions that people don't know quite how it works. Okay, um, we have another question from Gloria Kim. Um, oh, this is a good one. Could you speak more about the lack of tangible backing up the digital representation? For instance, does the digital representation lose value when the creator or Patreon moves to another platform? How tied is the value of digital representation to that specific platform? That's a really good question. And uh, I think especially in the streaming context, we there's not enough competition for us to see what it's like for yeah. when one person moves from one platform to another. And so I think Ninja is a really interesting case because he's one of the first case studies where a huge streamer on Twitch actually moved to Mixer um, and took a lot of the subscribers with him. And But I think that, like as I mentioned before, not all patrons are obsessed with the virtual gifts or the digital representation. I think that those who are will probably be upset if that person leaves the platform because then it, they will, it will be like losing all your points, right? Mm. Um, but definitely not all patrons are there for, for that recognition. So I, I think it will be interesting to see, especially as Mixer becomes bigger, what we see with all this kind of cross-platform activity. And it could be that uh, streamers realize that um, when you have, when you're managing all this multiple media and right now, there's not, for example, you don't really make money through Twitter by being a power Twitter user, or you don't make money through uh, through Instagram, unless you, aside from the ads. But mm -hmm. once those systems, if they start implementing this patronage system, I think it will be really fascinating to see how creators manage that, and if there will then be services that try to link all of those things together. Cool. Okay. Um, I think that's just about all we have time for. Um, let me do one more round of in the room things. Uh, and I'm not seeing sort of frantic waving from coming from anywhere. Frantic waving. David, frantic waving. All right. You've got two and a half minutes. All right. So it seemed like a lot of the motivations had to do with the relationship or perceived relationship between the patron and the creator. Mm -hmm. One thing I've noticed over the past like year or so is that communities that follow creators are going on other platforms to talk about the creators, like Discord, where you're hanging out with other people in another chat and voice chatting and hanging out with that community. So how important do you think those communities are to this economy around a creator, separate from the creator's personality? Right. Once you're in it, you're really in it. You get those emoticons for the other people there, not right. so much to show your relationship to that creator. Right, right. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, the community aspect is what I think is what makes kind of digital patronage different from the one-off donations because it's not just me and the creator. It's me, other patrons, and the creator. And then kind of in the middle... Um, someone that I haven't talked about is moderators. So as these communities get bigger, pay, uh, creators have a hard time managing the volume of kind of conversations on their own. And so they need people to help out with that. And so moderators are there not only to like delete bad content, but they're also there to facilitate uh, discussions. And this happens a lot, especially on live stream, because the creator is live producing some kind of content so they can't be looking at the chat the whole time and sometimes when people post something and the streamer is unable to respond sometimes people get very upset it's like i just said something why won't you respond to that and a lot of times that's when moderators can also jump in and, and start facilitating the conversations so there's this um kind of thing where as a streamer builds a, a larger and larger following, they also need to recruit human moderators to help sustain that community. And so, I mean, that's like a whole other talk, but you know, that dynamics with moderators is really fascinating as well and how they recruit them and how they manage them. And 
Um, so there's a lot of this kind of people management that happens, not just from the creator patron perspective, but also like all the in between people as well. Cool. All right. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for thank coming you. from all of Mozilla. So we are fun. delighted to have you here. And that was a super talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.